Welcome everyone to this online Swarthmore lecture. This is the first time we've presented the lecture wholly online. So please bear with us if we do have any issues, which of course are always possible with internet connections and doing anything for the first time. My name is Sandra Berry, and I'm the director of Woodbrook, the Quaker learning charity. I'm talking to you from our residential center in Birmingham, and my colleagues and Tom are across the country in their own homes. I should have been introducing the lecture in front of a sea of faces at the yearly meeting gathering. And in so many ways, I can see those faces tonight. We are gathered. Some of you will be listening to the lecture alone, some with other members of the household. Some will have a quiet space and others won't. Some of you will be comfortable sitting for an hour and others will find that difficult. But we're all here together as one community. The Swarthmore Lecture is an annual lecture hosted by Woodbrook. Started in 1908, it is a core part of the work of Woodbrook and an important aspect of the life of, life of Quakers in Britain. The theme and topic of the lecture is chosen with the hope that it is of interest, relevance and nourishment to the Quaker community and wider society at the given time. Who could possibly have known that this year's theme of hope in troubled times would be so pertinent to our current circumstances. But I'm not at all surprised, given that we view the lecture as Quaker ministry, which springs from the spirit. Some of you joining us tonight might not be familiar with Quakers or only know us from history books and RE lessons. All are welcome. And I'm delighted that Tom Shakespeare is speaking to our theme tonight. Tom is Professor of Disability Research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's worshipped at Newcastle, Geneva, Norwich, Wyndham and Westminster Quaker meetings. He's a social scientist and bioethicist who has worked particularly on disability and on genetics. And his books include Disability Rights and Wrongs, Genetic Politics and Disability, The Basics. He's been involved in the disability rights movement for more than 30 years and has been involved in the arts for nearly as long. And he currently broadcasts regularly on BBC Radio 4. Tom's lecture is titled Openings to the Infinite Ocean, A Friendly Offering of Hope. And I'll now pass over to Tom and we'll have a few moments of silent waiting before he will start the lecture when he is ready. Friends, I wrote this year's Swarthmore Lecture in the months before the coronavirus epidemic caused despair to many who have lost loved ones and showed the fault lines in our society. We mourn all those who have died. We mourn the health workers, the care homes which seem to have been unsupported, the care workers in the community. We berate what looks like incompetence and hypocrisy. It is obvious why we are hopeless. We have more to worry about than a devastating virus. Today, where every day brings more news of global warming, extreme weather events, where our leaders seem collectively to have taken leave of their senses, and where populist policies and politicians are undermining peace and prosperity, it's easy to be pessimistic. There have been tough times before, but this year, everything looks extremely gloomy. The gamble on the market appears to have failed. 
increasing numbers of jobs for blue collar and now white collar workers are being lost through automation and AI. Many are exploiting themselves in the gig economy. Inequality in UK society increased greatly in the 1990s. And we're now one of the most unequal societies in the world. Younger generations saddled with student debt are finding it very hard to match the prosperity of their parents. Wider afield, we don't live in peaceful times. The conflict in the Middle East appears unresolvable and getting worse. A rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia results in bloody proxy wars in Somalia, Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan appear not to have benefited from Western intervention. Here at home, we have had the experience of Me Too and Black Lives Matter, which challenge us all to think about our privilege and about abuse. Reading the testimony of our forefathers in Quaker faith and practice, what most depresses me is that we have had many of the same problems for generation after generation. What might be new is realization of the environmental crisis we face. Unrestrained market fundamentalism has been incapable of factoring in public goods such as environmental protection. Temperature is rising. More extreme weather events follow with all the deaths, dislocations, and refugee movements that they bring in their wake. Species face extinction. Plastic waste accumulates. No wonder Greta Thunberg has said, adults keep saying we owe it to the younger people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. Many young people today feel this desperation that Thunberg highlights. But young and old, we all have a stake in creation. I disagree with Greta Thunberg. Hope is not the same as optimism. To have hope is not to expect a better future. It is not a pan-glossian confidence that all will be well, all will be for the best in the best of all possible worlds. You can be fearful and yet hopeful. We have to take action to bring about a better outcome. As Quakers, we have our testimonies to peace, truth, quality, simplicity. We have our social witness, but are these enough? Does an emergency not demand more of us? Where can we find hope where everything looks dark? It's perhaps hard to imagine today, but there are certainly moments in human history when it seems that the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what I read in the New Testament, in particular in the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles. Paul burns with missionary enthusiasm as he travels around the ancient world. What an intense people those early Christians were. They lived in an expectation of the second coming of Christ and the end times. And then the institutionalization of Christianity takes over. In the 1200s, Francis of Assisi comes to reform, to tread in the footsteps of Christ, to preach unity with creation. He sets out to restore the message of Jesus. He says, your God is of your flesh. He lives in your nearest neighbor, in every man. His friars go out amongst the poor and live the gospel. His mentor said to them, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. In 1647, along comes George Fox, seeking a new intimacy with God and preaching again a simple Christianity. Fox, like Francis, was rejecting his secure background. The intensity of his charismatic vision, coupled with his genius for organization, leads to the growth of the religious society of friends in the 1650s 
and its consolidation during the rest of the century. Those early Quakers roaming the countryside were also very much like those early Christians. Quakers felt that existing churches taught the husk, not the vital life at the heart of religion. They believed they had the same presence of Christ in their lives as the early Christians did. Early Quakerism is Pauline Christianity revived. Jesus had said, for when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Paul says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to someone sitting nearby, let the first person be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. I'm sure that those early Christians gathering in private houses were waiting on the Spirit in the same way as we Quakers have done for 350 years. Early friends spoke from a belief that the values of the real world were false. Listen to Edward Burroughs. We are not for names, nor men, nor titles of government, nor are we for this party or against the other, but we are for justice and mercy and truth and peace and true freedom, that these may be exalted in our nation. Theirs was the Lamb's War. Isaac Pennington wrote, give over thine own willing, give over thy own running, give over thine own desiring to know or be anything, and sink down to the seed which God sows in the heart, and let that grow in thee, and be in thee, and breathe in thee, and act in thee. This mystical injunction to obedience to God, indeed unity with God, reminds us how very biblical and Christian those early Quakers were. Then Quakers had all the mysticism of the Catholic tradition together with the outrageous certainty that they could know God directly. As Margaret Fell famously records George Fox preaching in Ulverston, in 17, 1652, you will say, Christ saith this, and the apostles say this, but what canst thou say? Art thou a child of light, and hast walked in the light? And what thou speakest, is it inwardly from God? But after the restoration of Charles II in 1660, Quakers retreated into quietism. Robert Barclay and William Penn ensured the theological coherence of Quakers by maintaining the forms, silent waiting, no clergy, no sacraments. Today, the lack of explicit belief talk perhaps means that we can better defend ourselves against the new atheists. But it also means we might be individually lost in Mark Russ's memorable phrase, we are a pilgrim people without a destination. In 2018, at my friend's encouragement, I set out to read a chapter of the Old and the New Testaments every day, together with a psalm or a selection of Proverbs. Everyone has their own path, but I was born again into a Christ-shaped future. I ended up feeling that Quakers needed to remember God, not think they could do very well without. It is this which could give us a sense of unity, of purpose, of what we're here for, why we're sitting in silence, why we have a vital purpose, as the Christian mystics we surely are or can be. We could be inspiring the busy, noisy practices of our neighboring faith communities, and offering a way back to God for the secular, soulless peoples among whom we live and work. Early Quakers often said, we preach Christ crucified. Today, I think even more importantly, could we not preach Christ incarnated amongst us? The desolating, jolting presence of the light born again every day 
in our own hearts and in our neighbourhoods. Quakers are fond of saying, let your life speak. I've watched with admiration how very many Quakers set up food banks and night shelters or promote restorative justice or work quietly for peace in troubled parts of the world. These actions were why I joined the society more than 20 years ago. But what George Fox wrote from Launceston Jail in 1656 was, let your life preach. It's not just about doing good works. We are called to be patterns and examples, just as the apostles were. But those early Quakers would surely consider the role of a friend was to enable God to be manifested through themselves. I take George Fox to be saying, you are the people who have been gathered, called to gather everyone into this new experience. I think this is a little more than simply leading an admirable life. Paul tells us in Galatians that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Letting your life preach is not about your own efforts. It might require letting go of the attempt to be a good person, stepping aside as an ego and being open to God working through you. In particular, I believe our silence is a gift, a mystical gift, which we can share with all Christians and others who have different faiths or who are looking for meaning because they have none. I have been to many Christian churches of different denominations. There is much there that we lack as Quakers, the prayer, the singing, the Bible, the sacraments. But there is also much noise, much bustle, much chaos, no silence. The still small voice of calm, which the Bible talks about and which Quaker worship embodies is often lacking. I think we can rediscover hope in that silence. There is an almost undetectable hum of love underneath the noise. If we can only turn off our phones, put aside our chores, center down and feel it together. I think people in this bustling, overwhelming 21st century need to find a mystical unity with God, even though they might not know it yet. They don't have to call this God. They can call it inner light, or calm, or mindfulness, or whatever gets them through. They can seek unity with the universe, or nature, or anything they like. It's all about slowing down, stopping, and letting reality in. I like the thought that life is like living in a house. Your dwelling has different rooms. One might be about matters intellectual. Another room is about matters emotional. One is about activities physical. And one is about the things spiritual. When you have a house, you don't spend equal time in all the rooms, but I think too many people never go into the room which is about the spirit. Quakers are here to say, all rooms are sacred. Come and sit in silence for a while with us. Find hope here. Quakerism is not simply an exercise in mindfulness. Silence is a way, not a destination. We seek to know each other in matters which are eternal. We are waiting on God, not just on the final handshake. And outside our meeting for worship, what to do? I think a good question might be to ask, what would make us, as friends, really unpopular today? As Quakers, it seems to me that we need to be a constant disturbance in society. Maybe we should be a troubling people.
In the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul famously speaks of faith, hope, and love. In the new heaven and new earth, love will remain, but there will be no need for hope. But what about faith? If we have faith, why do we need hope? Paul provides an answer in Romans, the crux of his theology. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have been gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Because we have faith, therefore we can hope for a good ending to our story. Paul says, for in hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The ending helps you make sense of the whole thing because we have faith. In Jürgen Moltmann's theology of hope, the ending is the light within which we see everything else. Hope and optimism are not the same. Optimism is the belief that things will be better in future. It is a cognitive belief. Hope is a quality of spirit, a feeling. You can have hope even if you're not optimistic. I think hope is a gift. What something often you receive when you surrender absolutely, not something you can generate yourself. Most people in the world spend their time hoping that in the end all will be well. Because we don't see very far ahead, then we require faith in order to remain steadfast in the dark times. Faith is like trust. Faith endures when you can't imagine how things could be better. As Julian of Norwich famously wrote, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Faith gives you the courage to take the next step. It's closely related to grace, the understanding that whatever we can do ourselves, it is nothing compared to what God can and will do. Sharing this vision of God's grace was George Fox, who in despair at the state of the world of 1647, wrote in his journal these words. I saw also that there was an ocean of darkness and death but an infinite ocean of light and love which flowed over the ocean of darkness. And in that also I saw the infinite love of God and I had great openings. A little over 300 years later and across the Atlantic, Dr. Martin Luther King said something very similar in reference to the struggle for civil rights and equality that he led. We must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. Otherwise, all we're really left with is the secular version of hope, which is little more than optimism without certainty. We have evidence that things were not always like this, and we hope that change is going to come. As Paul says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. We thousands sit silently. As we sit there waiting for guidance, our worship is all about hope. It is about now, the imminence of God in the present moment. It can be about the future too, our hope that we will be given answers, even when we can't frame the right questions. I love that great Quaker phrase, proceed as the way opens. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And meanwhile, we trust to love to keep us close while we're waiting. George Fox wrote to his parents in 1652. Oh, be faithful, look not back, nor be too forward, further than ye have attained, for ye have no time but the present time. Therefore, prize your time for your soul's sake. Listen to these words in Revelation, 
I am making all things new. Remember that George Fox particularly liked the book of Revelation or the confidence of the book of Hebrews. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. So much of modern life is a utilitarian arithmetic. We compete for success. We look for justice, a fair return for our efforts. I do this and therefore I deserve that. But God doesn't work like this at all. The message I take from the New Testament is that our efforts are not entered into a ledger like a profit and loss account. The repeated message of the gospel is that it is not about our own efforts. I love the parable of the vineyard in Matthew. So the last will be first and the first will be last. That's the topsy-turvy topology of the kingdom of God. It's not about just desserts. It's about love. The prodigal son is greeted with forgiveness by his father. It's Mary who gets things right, who neglects her chores to sit with Jesus. Think about that costly alabaster box of perfume. God is revealed through weakness, not strength. Through failure, not success. Through need, not independence. We welcome everyone to the great feast the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame, people everyone. We are looking for that of God in everyone, which isn't about everyone being a little bit wonderful. It's about everyone being a vessel for God to work through. The kingdom of heaven is a way of acting now, a way of being in this world. It means the transformed human condition, a humanity free of selfishness. It means the beloved community. One of my disability heroes, Antonio Gramsci, was an Italian communist intellectual put in prison under Mussolini. And his famous motto was pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Where and how could we be optimistic in 2020? Faced with grim news of climate change and conflict and division, I think we need to remember and have faith. Things will not always be like this. A change is gonna come. We may need to swap around our lenses from time to time if we're to see everything clearly. And if vision is not your thing, consider how you might listen differently. It's about the different stories that we need to tell and the different perspectives that we should take. First, we might want to put things in perspective. Humans are often very influenced by individual stories and don't always see the bigger picture. We tend to have headline anxiety. Worrying about stuff you can't affect is pointless. Far better to let some of it wash over you. Worrying about stuff you can't affect is pointless. The late Swedish academic Hans Rosling referred to factfulness as a means of keeping world news in perspective. If we focus on the bigger picture, such as the proportion of people living in extreme poverty halving in the last 20 years, it may be easier to remain hopeful. Rosling called it understanding as a source of mental peace. He says, when you hear about something terrible, calm yourself by asking, if there had been a positive improvement, would I have heard about that? We believe that the world is going to hell in a handcart. That's not true, it's simply not true. The New York Times journalist, Nicholas Kristof reminds us every single day in recent years, another 325,000 people got their first access to electricity. Each day, more than 200,000 got piped water for the first time. And some 650,000 people went online for the first time every single day. Historically, nearly half of all children died before adulthood. In 1950, approximately one quarter of children in the world 
died in childhood. Now, less than 5% do. 10% of people now live in extreme poverty, defined as subsisting on less than $2 a day. But in 1981, 42% of people lived in extreme poverty. World literacy is now 85% of the population. When I was born in 1966, it was less than half the population. The coronavirus is going to devastate the societies of the global south, but it won't halt this sort of progress for long. One question is about framing, by which I mean what is remembered and what is unheard. Today, too often, we hear about the percentage that goes wrong rather than the percentage that goes well. The media focus on disasters and bad news stories. Given that psychology tells us how much better our brains are at holding on to the negative rather than the positive, this active effort will be worthwhile. We shouldn't th pretend things are better than they are, but too much pessimism is paralyzing. Secondly, we might want to look in close up. What I mean is that if we take our magnifying glasses out and look in detail, we might be able to observe examples of good practice that are obscure if we only look at first glance. For example, over the last few years, I've been doing research with disabled people in Africa who've had success. And the story we get about disability in Africa is mostly negative. Disabled kids are more likely to be out of school. Households with disabled members face multidimensional poverty. But that's not the whole story. Quite easily, my collaborators and I gathered more than 100 stories of disabled people in Uganda, Kenya, and Zambia who had achieved success in their own lives on an equal basis to non-disabled others. They had demonstrated resilience, which is partly about their own determination and intelligence, but it's also about the support they received from family members who believed in them, teachers who had backed them, organizations that had given concrete support, whether that's giving them a wheelchair or paying their school or university fees. As a result, my respondents had ended up as civil servants or lawyers or farmers or teachers or shopkeepers, generally doing well and usually married and with kids of their own too. Not only did these folk proudly tell me I was the only member of my family to finish school, in turn, they were supporting other members of their family, siblings or relatives, paying it forward, letting them go through school. Every one of these folk challenges the stereotype that disabled people cannot succeed, that they are a bad investment, that the disabled child will never amount to anything, that none of them could have done it on their own. Another example, people with intellectual disabilities don't want to be socially isolated, which they sometimes are in group homes set in the community, but not of the community. I, I found that many people I've spoken to in my research had experienced bullying. And before gathering these stories, I didn't think it was possible that anyone could be so vile to people with intellectual disability. Which is why WAVE for Change in Muswell Hill is so important. WAVE stands for We're All Valued Equally, a social enterprise aiming to provide integrated spaces for those with learning disabilities and those without. They run a cafe, a weekly play group for families of children with special needs, a young adult group, an inclusive church, research gauging attitudes to disability in their local area, and an award for the local business doing most to be inclusive to those with learning disabilities. They stand for the unconditional love of God and the drive to build communities that are welcoming to all. In Norfolk, where I used to live, Sing Your Heart Out, or SYHO, S-Y-H-O, SYHO, is a network of community singing workshops. They don't want to call it a choir, aimed at people who have mental health problems, but open to all. This is a voluntary arts group, not a branch of social services or the health service. People come as individuals, and there's no requirement to disclose anything. 
You might be sitting next to the chair of the Mental Health Trust or somebody with a lifelong history of schizophrenia. And SciHo has become a lifeline to many people who've been receiving treatment for mental illness. As one participant said, it's given me a new confidence. I was scared and anxious and I was only used to unfriendly people. I got welcomed. The people were very nice. I really enjoyed it. Each week in four different towns across Norfolk, people gather for an afternoon of communal singing with excellent singing teachers to guide them. Singing is powerful in itself, making people feel part of something bigger than themselves. But the event is more than an arts project. The afternoon includes a tea break with good biscuits. And there is conversation and sometimes problem solving and referral to other sources of support. A regular event every week is perhaps the only activity for which people leave the house. Their morale improves. They often even require less medication to calm and console them. It's a low cost intervention requiring only the room hire, refreshments and payment to the singing teachers. And during coronavirus, it goes on online. Now, developed by Professor Dixon Chibanda, the Friendship Bench Intervention for Common Mental Disorders has been running in Zimbabwe since 2006. Lay health workers, most often grandmothers aged on average 58 with just eight years of schooling, will deliver a problem solving intervention at a bench placed near a clinic. It starts with opening the mind. The client shares his or her story. Then comes uplifting. The health worker helps the client prioritize the problems and brainstorm solutions. Next comes reassurance, checking to see if all went well, making a home visit if necessary. After five sessions on the friendship bench, the client is invited to join a support group. People get a chance to share their experiences. They're taught to crochet bags or mats from recycled plastic materials. And this activity helps people uh, keep productive and keeps their minds peaceful. There might also be singing or prayer. And after a successful trial, the friendship bench has now been scaled up to about 70 primary healthcare clinics in Zimbabwe. There are now approximately 400 grandmothers involved as lay health workers and about 30 grandfathers too. Quakers in particular will take heart from an intervention developed uh, by Professor Chris Bunnell and other colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, aimed at reducing bullying in schools. Learning together is based on a whole school approach which changes policies and systems, not just lessons in class. A key element is to increase student engagement with school. The second is restorative justice, which aims to resolve conflicts between students and between students and staff. When victims tell perpetrators how their behavior has affected them, this can lead to a change. Finally, social and emotional education teaches young people skills for managing relationships. After two years, bullying had reduced by nearly 10%. Students had higher quality of life and well-being and were also less likely to have tried alcohol or drugs or to be regular smokers. Let's think about homelessness. Almost every week of the year on a Tuesday at a community kitchen in Ramsgate, the St George's Community Meal brings together people who are homeless, have substance misuse problems or are simply isolated. Folk might have had problems with universal credit or homelessness in a local economy in Thanet, which is far from resilient. Over a year, around 300 people benefit with about 40 people on a typical evening. The project is staffed by volunteers from local hospitals and funded by the diocese. Local restaurants often help with providing the meals. It's a very low key project with a huge welcome for everyone. What about children in care? New Beginnings is a project in Stockport run by Yadwiga Lee. She works with families who are known to local authority children's services. 
Often, these are mothers who are misusing alcohol or drugs or, her, or who are survivors of domestic abuse, or mothers whose children have been previously removed by children's services. New Beginnings recognizes that parents are yesterday's children. Most failing mothers are themselves victims of abuse and poverty and exclusion. Over 24 weeks, mothers are taken through a therapeutic process which helps them recognize how wider contextual issues have caused the problems they face today. New Beginnings enables mothers to connect with each other. They feel less alone. They get their children back. Now they mentor others. These stories tell us that good things are happening when you look close up. They show how human beings have the capacity to bounce back. And perhaps most importantly, they're evidence that when people work together in a common purpose, things improve. A change is going to come. If you believe in people, rather than resorting to stereotypes, they can be different. Together, we are building the kingdom of heaven. Finally, we might want to take the long view. Bad things are hard to endure, sometimes impossible to endure, but everything passes. In Britain, the blitz must have been terrifying. In my local park in Kennington, just up the road here, there's a very moving memorial to those who have died when an air raid shelter, simply a network of trenches in the ground, had a direct hit. Mostly women and children, the youngest just three months old, many were killed, at least 104, perhaps more. And the memorial stone that's standing there has a quotation from Maya Angelou. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Across Britain, approximately 40,000 people died as a result of the wartime bombing. In the fire bombing of Dresden by the Allied forces in February 1944, up to 25,000 people died in that one uh, process alone. Taking a long view helps not to forget, but to move on. As with the terrible events of the Holocaust, we can never not remember. We could say something similar of the AIDS epidemic, which killed so many millions. There are lessons to learn, but we don't have to live this terror every day. It's not just that bad things end and time passes. Subspecie eternitatis is 17th century philosopher Baruch de Spinoza's phrase for putting things into the context of eternity. It's a good exercise, particularly if you think you're important, or you think that someone else is pretty worthless, or you think that some problem is irresolvable. If we take a long view, what does it matter? What you have earned? How many mountains you have climbed? How beautiful you are? As the Italian proverb states, after the game, the king and the pawn go back into the same box. We usually take a subjective view, considering how things matter to us. Whereas if we take an objective view, we might be more sanguine. Disasters give way to recovery. Problems can be mitigated. Good triumphs in the end. I'm not saying all those deaths don't matter in the long run. Usually, things rally because of collective human action. As with the school climate strikes, an extinction rebellion, and HIV treatment activism, which shows that we shouldn't simply surrender to events which we believe we cannot control. But if we take a long view, then we might be less pessimistic about everyday problems and more hopeful for long-term resolutions. Earlier, I quoted that motto, 
that Antonio Gramsci repeated during his many years in prison. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. This is not just a, ho a hopeful couplet to console us while we wait for things to improve. It's an injunction to action. It's not the anonymous forces of history that bring down the dictator. It's collective human action. It may be the cumulative effect of small acts of protest leading to small changes, or large ones like Extinction Rebellion and the Stansted 15 who blocked a deportation flight. It may be the threat of a good example. We are for justice and mercy and truth and peace and true freedom that these may be exalted in our nation. While I was writing this lecture, I went back to Sri Lanka for a week because it's where my mother comes from. Things don't always go right in Sri Lanka any more than in the rest of the world. But what I particularly appreciate is the ubiquitous Sri Lankan response to difficulty and disaster. When the railway breaks down or the shower fails or the flight is canceled, the Sri Lankan replies with the deathless phrase, what to do? What to do doesn't mean what shall we do? It's not a request for help. It's an admission that the situation is helpless. It communicates a sense of fatalism and acceptance. What to do suggests that there are things that you just have to put up with. There's no use in fighting everything. Some fates just have to be endured, like Joe and his boils. Sometimes overthinking is the worst response. Sometimes fighting is the worst response. Acceptance helps. Distraction is good. For example, when enduring chronic pain, not focusing on the problem is best. Evidence shows that when people with chronic pain have solicitous partners, they report worse pain. In other words, if someone is always asking you about your pain, then you'll focus on your pain and feel it more acutely. If everyone ignores it and you find distractions, then the pain will be less present and thus less of a problem. I'm not saying simply mind over matter. The pain is real, doesn't go away, but the more you concentrate on it, the worse it gets. I feel that what's true of physical pain may be true of many problems and difficulties in life. Often we seek to control things by understanding them. If we see what caused them, we might be able to solve them or at least prevent them from recurring. Yet many difficulties either cannot be understood or else cannot be prevented. In these cases, maybe, we just have to find ways to endure. It's an exercise in understanding our limitations. Disasters happen. Medicine fails us. Not everything can be fixed. Helpless does not mean hopeless, and resignation is not the same as despair. Hope is a necessary approach for everyone, a buttress against despair. Philosophers define hope as a desire for a state of affairs coupled with the belief that it is possible, even if not certain. We don't bother hoping for something we're certain we're going to get, nor do we hope for something we know we won't get. Remember Paul. In palliative care, when a person is suffering from terminal illness, caregivers have to be careful not to promote false hope, which would be dishonest and misleading, even if it improved the well-being of the individual. Benevolent paternalism is no longer the acceptable approach for healthcare workers. At the same time, for a patient to lose all hope would be very bad for their well-being. A rational hope has a higher chance of fulfillment. An irrational hope is based on a false or over-optimistic belief. In illness, hope is very helpful in improving well-being and avoiding depression. Yet to think in terms of miracle cures or to over-inflate the chance that a treatment will be successful may be unrealistic or dishonest. It would be a deception that undermines patient autonomy. Gabriel Marcel gives a way through this dilemma 
by talking about the experience of hope, particularly hope against hope. He talks about absolute hope rather than hope for something specific, based on his thoughts about prisoners in World War I and the danger of despair. Absolute hope means, firstly, maintaining a sense of self, sometimes called living until you die. Secondly, waiting patiently and actively, not fixating on the inevitable end, being open to new experiences. And most importantly, finally, maintaining a communal aspect to life, having a hope in someone. Absolute hope prevents the descent into despair, but is not based on an illusion or false optimism. I think it's what the Bible means when it talks about the virtues of fortitude, which means firmness and difficulties. Psychologists might prefer to talk in terms of resilience. The virtue of resilience is an ordinary magic, to use Anne Maston's phrase, which all human beings possess. Faced by adversity, the common response is to cope, adapt and survive. In a world full of climate catastrophe, disease, poverty, war and a threatened economic downturn, saying what to do doesn't mean we simply throw up our hands and give up. It's not the same fatalism as concluding it is the will of God and that therefore there's nothing to be done. Quakers are working for the kingdom of God today. We have hope. We know you can make a difference. What to do is completely compatible with working patiently and with others to improve our society and to restore our environment. As Grace Paley says, the only recognizable feature of hope is action. We need to strike a balance between taking action and not feeling you have to do everything yourself. In January 2019, I visited the Holocaust exhibition at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Amidst indescribable suffering and barbarity, it was the stories of the righteous among the Gentiles, the righteous among the generations, people like Oskar Schindler, those individuals who resisted the Nazi project, which filled me with hope, even when their personal actions were defeated. Remember, there were 26,973 righteous among the nations from 51 countries. Read their stories, you'll find them uh, easily on Wikipedia. The lesson I take from that resistance to the Holocaust is that we cannot be passive. Better days do not drop into your lap. They have to be actively worked for. This means taking responsibility, exercising agency, being grown up, rather than resorting to the politics of victimhood and complaint. If we do really follow the promptings of love and truth in our heart, everything we do is worthwhile. Trust that the leadings of love and truth come right. Even under fascism, people resist through extraordinary bravery. In the civil rights era, Rosa Parks refused to go to the back of the bus where the black folk were meant to go. Men and women were whipped and clubbed, but resisted. In South Africa, thousands burned their pass cards. Steve Biko was killed. Ruth First was blown up. Alby Sachs was maimed. Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. Hundreds of others died. But eventually, the Nazis were defeated. Civil rights came to America. Apartheid was ended. Yet the struggle continues because the full promise of such victories is rarely achieved, which is why we keep repeating Black Lives Matter and the other slogans and movements of our own time. For most of us, it means mainly small acts of resistance, which cost us less. They are not substitutes for the big actions, but they are part of the same story. The people who voluntarily agree to take fewer flights, to eat less meat, to contribute towards food banks, may not be solving 
the problems we face, but they're doing their bit too. We need to challenge the dominant instrumentalism to say that things and people and relationships and places are important in themselves, not just as a means to an end. We need to challenge individualism, the pursuit of individual greed, which means that the things we have in common, the global commons, are threatened. I think it's a matter of inner, outer and across. Inner might mean changing your own lifestyle or your mind. Outer might mean working for change in the world. Across might mean making connections with other people, which will make both the inner and the outer work more likely to succeed. We need to be clear about what is about our own lives and lifestyles and what is due to wider structures. We need to change lifestyles. I think of this as our inner work. We need to work for change. I think of this as our outer work. To make both succeed, we need to make connections. I think of this as us working across barriers. We're all interdependent. We do better with others, inner, outer, and across. We have to have our, all three to realize fully the potential that each of us have and to make the difference that we can make together and to do it as one. Doing good on our doorsteps or in our kitchens is not enough unless we make public good break out in the world. And we cannot make that happen unless we link up with others, regardless of who they are and what they bring. We are building the beloved community, to use Martin Luther King's phrase. Joanna Macy and Chris Johnson talk about active hope, which for them is a practice with three phases. First, we need a clear view of reality. Second, we need to identify what we are hoping for, so we know which direction to go in. Third, we need to take steps to move in that direction. Rather than either the business as usual narrative in which nothing needs to change, or the great unraveling narrative in which we're going to hell in a handcart, they offer the story of the great turning, where we find and offer our gift of active hope and develop new life-sustaining systems and practices. Enthusiasm is a valuable, renewable resource, they say. The work is difficult, but it is worthwhile. To ask where is the hope is to ask where is the cause that can inspire, not just us, but the whole world. Where can we bear witness? Where can we make a difference? Where can we change things? That won't be the same for all of us, but we can all definitely make a difference, small or large. We are for justice and mercy and truth and peace and true freedom, that these may be exalted in our nation. Remember Archimedes, the Greek engineer and thinker, who said that he could move the world if he had a lever and a place to stand. So what is our lever? Our lever is love. And where must we stand? Where we find ourselves. Where we sit and stand right now. As we hear this and as we read this. As John Lewis did, the veteran of Selma and Congress who died last month. Love is our lever. Here is our place to stand. As Quakers, we don't think we are perfect, but we think we can be perfected. We are constantly striving, though we never quite make it. The Bible is full of precedents for this. Moses never made it to the promised land. Those prophets endured defeat, exile, the destruction of their temple. Soren Kierkegaard said that the Hebrew Bible can be summed up in one word, nevertheless. Sheena Pugh wrote a wonderful poem, Sometimes, which I want to leave with you now. Sometimes things don't go, after all, from bad to worse. 
Some years, muscadel faces down frost. Green thrives, the crops don't fail. Sometimes a man aims high and all goes well. A people sometimes will still step back from war. Elect an honest man, decide they care enough that they can't leave some stranger poor. Some men become what they are born for. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow that seemed half frozen. May it happen for you. I'm grateful for the ministry that we've heard this evening and I thank you all for joining us for this live event. Have a look at our page on our website and you should find the link there to buy the book which you can download immediately as an ebook or if you opt for a printed copy I'm very pleased to say the Quaker Centre Bookshop is aiming to send them out before the end of this month. On our website, you can sign up for the follow-up sessions and our website is woodbrook.org.uk and you can find the information on the Swarthmore page. I hope you will indulge me for one moment longer to give thanks for all the support that Woodbrook has received in such challenging times. Thank you, friends. Thank you to our lecturer and thank you all for being part of the 2020 Swarthmore Lecture.